Global power structures today seem to be in perpetual flux. The US-led international system that was put into place after World War II is being contested by countries such as China, Brazil, and most surprisingly a whole host of African countries such as Nigeria and South Africa. This is what is often referred to as the rise of the rest, a process whereby countries who suffered under the yoke of colonial rule are now increasing their GDP, creating a middle class, and as a consequence of this, are looking for more influence on the international stage. For many observers today, this comes as a surprise. During the post-war period, decolonization had occurred, but a lot of the potential of these new post-colonial societies had been lost because a lot of former colonies in the 1960s and 70s were turned into an arena where the Soviet Union and the United States competed uh, for influence. Both superpowers wanted to prove their ideology, uh, capitalism or communism, wanted to prove that that ideology was superior by investing in all sorts of modernization programs. Uh, and this often led to a lot of violent conflict because these new post-colonial leaders actually tried to play off the superpowers against one another so that they could obtain more aid. And when the Berlin Wall came down in November 1989 and the Cold War suddenly came to an end, many saw the emergence of a unipolar world. The United States, the capitalist ideology, had outcompeted the Soviet Union and would now dominate uh, international affairs. At least that was the expectation. So the question then becomes what, what happened? To answer that question, I take a radically, radically different view of the world. I argue that the changes that we are witnessing now can only be understood by looking at how, how the decolonization process in the 1950s and 60s changed the international system. Rather than looking solely at communism or, communism or capitalism as the forces that influenced and shaped international affairs between 1945 and 1989, I think it's important to look at anti-colonial ideologies and how they shaped the foreign policies of African countries, countries that I look at, that form the geographical focus of my research. And specifically, I look at the ideology of Pan-Africanism, which is a conscious movement that began at the end of the 19th century among men and women of African descent who, made their, who, who claimed, who made the case that Africa had to unite so that they could actually have a bigger role in international affairs. And this, this movement, why, why it is often overlooked, why this ideology is over, often overlooked in international affairs, is because it started out as a relatively obscure set of ideas in the 1930s. Uh, people like Marcus Garvey uh, wanted to repatriate African slaves to the African continent, and he was sort of one of, one of those intellectuals behind Pan-Africanism. Now, in 1957, all of this changed when the former colony of the Gold Coast, Ghana, became independent and also provided the first black prime minister of the African continent. He really built his foreign policy, the foreign policy of this new country of Ghana, on Pan-African ideas. He wanted to unite uh, the African con continent under his leadership. And two elements in particular within Pan-Africanism are are really important to understand foreign policy. One is the idea of the African personality, because uh, colonialism was seen as a system that oppressed uh, Africans. Uh, and Krumah really argued that Africans had to find their self-worth and really had to uh, believe, what, believe in things they had achieved in the past. A second element in his foreign policy was the notion of positive neutrality, of non-alignment. He didn't want to play off the Cold War superpowers against each other to get more aid. He actually wanted to shelter Africa from the Cold War, and he didn't want to be involved in these conflicts because he believed that this would lead to more violence and a new colonization of Africa. Now, these ideas um, are really, uh, really important uh, not only to understand or rethink the position of the Cold War in the long 20th century, but also to rethink international affairs today. If you want to understand why African leaders today respond to international problems in the way they do, uh, it is important to understand that they see a lot of the decisions that are made in Europe and in the US as part of that long struggle for, uh, for independence, as part of that long liberation struggle.